文章，在 Nature 也发过文章的话 ，Nature 的文章就是 Nicholas Chief 教授他们团队发表的。那么不再耽误大家时间，我们下面就有请 Nicholas Chief 教授给大家做精彩的学术报告。Hi, it's a pleasure、uh, to speak with you today.、Um, I'm Dr. Nicholas Schiff from Wild Cornell Medicine, and I'd like to thank、uh, Professor Stephen Lorries and Professor Haibo D for the opportunity to present my work、uh, at this e-symposium. My talk today is going to be on the late recovery of function after severe structural brain injuries that can be induced by central thalamic deep brain stimulation. Before I begin, I'll just mention some disclosures. I am on the scientific advisory board of two companies, Inspire DBS and Quantal X, and a listed inventor on several patents、uh, held by Cornell University. My current grant funding comes from the National Institutes of Health, the McDonald Foundation, and private foundations. So the talk that I'm going to give to you today is going to focus on the、uh, the use of central thalamic deep brain stimulation in the context of The meso circuit model for recovery of integrative brain function following multifocal brain injuries. And I'm going to basically, in the half an hour or so that we have here, give you three examples to illustrate late recovery of function and brain plasticity induced by central thalamic stimulation. And the three examples are going to range across the、um, the outcomes of coma and severe brain injury, beginning. With、uh, patients in the minimally conscious state, and I'll show you an example of restoration of spoken communication and goal-directed movements in a patient in minimally conscious state, beginning six years after their injury.、Um, I will show you an example of the restoration of sleep-wake architecture in a different patient in minimally conscious state、uh, who began their treatment with deep brain stimulation 20 years after their injury. And then finally, I'll bring you to. The more recent work that we're currently doing, and as part of an ongoing clinical trial, looking at restoring high-level cognitive function and resistance to fatigue in patients who will initially begin in coma but have an outcome in the range of moderate to severe traumatic brain injury.、Uh, and the first subject、uh, through this trial, whose data I will show you today, today、uh, deep brain stimulation of central thalamus began 18 years after injury. So when I say late, I mean very late, decades、uh, after injury. And I think these findings、um, invite clinicians to explore and to think about the residual and latent capacities in all patients after structural brain injury and what what we might be able to achieve. So let's go on. So to begin,、um, I'm framing the talk, and we frame our thinking around an expanded mesocircuit frontal parietal model. This is something Dr. Lorries and I have been、uh, thinking about for many years and bringing our research programs together around this. Review by Dr. Giacino,、uh, Finns, Lorries, and myself, and Nature Reviews Neurology in 2014. I think is more, one of the more comprehensive reviews right now that kind of makes the, these linkages. And the meso circuit model,、uh, in essence, proposes that with multifocal brain injury, because of the connectivity of the central thalamus to frontal parietal and striatal、um, neuronal pools, that Deafferentation, multifocal deafferentation, will produce a broad downregulation of the frontal striatal system and the frontal parietal system through、uh, the loss of either function or afferent、uh, input to to these regions via this central thalamic projection system. And as I'll show you in a moment, these neurons in the central thalamus. Centered in the central lateral nucleus, have a unique geometry of connection and、uh, control via neuromodulatory systems. One nice thing about this model, which I won't、um, spend any time on in this lecture, but refer you to the、uh, review, is that it organizes in one common framework many different interventions and disorders of consciousness that have demonstrated efficacy, including the use of the drug amantadine, the use, the paradoxical use of the drug zolpidem. Uh, and the use of other brain stimulation technologies, such as transcranial direct current stimulation. So, just to orient us to where we are,、um, this is a, a study done by Mircea Steriad、uh, in、um, 1982 and Lloyd Glenn, who showed that neurons in the mesencephalic reticular formation, which project into the central thalamus, concentrate their innervations here in the central lateral nucleus of the、uh, of the thalamus. And 
the central lateral nucleus of the thalamus is special because the neurons within this area have very unique uh, anatomical projection structure. So this is a single fiber tracing in the rat of a central lateral thalamic neuron. It makes a first synapse in the reticular nucleus, and then the axon continues on. And this is again, one neuron's axon arborizing over the entire rostral striatum, and then continuing on into the frontal cortex. So that's a single neuron with all of this anatomical pro projection structure. These neurons, in turn, are controlled very tightly by brainstem arousal regulation pathways. So the central lateral nucleus, this is the human brain, receives among the densest uh, region, de densest um, amounts of acetylcholinergic projection from the brainstem. And the central lateral nucleus neurons also receive a very dense projection from the locus ceruleus of noradrenergic. Uh, projecting neurons. So the, uh, these are not the only control mechanisms um, here in, in CL and the, the deep brain, um, the deep brain stem uh, glutamatergic uh, projections from the mesencephalic reticular formation are among other glutamatergic projections from the reticular formation, including the nucleus gigantocellularis in the medulla and uh, parapontine uh, reticular formation projections as well. Um, I won't be reviewing them here, but just, just so one can understand that this is the really the region of the central thalamus that we think of when we're talking about central thalamic deep brain stimulation. To watch uh, these neurons in action, uh, Jin Lee and her team at Stanford organized a very uh, beautiful series of experiments in 62 rats, all of which were transduced with uh, um, viral vectors producing uh, halo channel rhodopsin and uh, activating uh, CL occurred through a light pipe while the animals were undergoing functional magnetic resonance imaging. And what Jin found was that activations at 40 and 100 Hertz produced broad um, initiation of activity in frontal and striatal neurons. And here we can watch in real time the 100 Hertz stimulation of the system in, in the uh, anesthetized rat in an fMRI. And as the blue light turns on, you see that the entire frontal striatal system of the ipsilateral hemisphere engages. And eventually, uh, elements of the contralateral medial frontal system around the cingulate cortex also are activated. And um, as you can see, when the laser light goes off, this activity has been so strongly driven that it continues and outlasts the um, the initial stimulation uh, producing a very marked carryover effect just for that short period of uh, stimulation which we just viewed in real time. So these this is this is a quick anatomical and physiologic review, but it underpins what I will show you as we move forward. So the first um, statistically rigorous demonstration that central thalamic deep brain stimulation could restore function late in the course of brain injury was uh, our study in 2007 of a 38-year-old man who had sustained a closed head injury six years prior uh, to entry into our study. This patient had had blunt trauma to the right frontal lobe, which produced bilateral subdural hematomas with the right greater than left dominance. Significant mass effect. Uh, the patient had both subfalcine uh, and central herniation central herniation down to midbrain level with a blown pupil on the right side. The initial uh, Glasgow coma scale of this patient was three, uh, and the patient remained in vegetative state till about three months when it was first noted that they had visual tracking. Uh, at 12 weeks, the patient went into a comprehensive rehabilitation program and remained in minimally conscious state throughout a two-year stay in the program at the highest level showing inconsistent command following with eye movements. With one eye patched, the patient could look to a yes or no card about 30% of the time. The patient was then readmitted four years after discharge or six years after injury uh, to enter into our clinical trial of deep brain stimulation. This clinical trial uh, had an extensive evaluation period, both pre and post-operatively. Uh, the patient actually had a six month period of reconstitution or rehabilitation uh, because they were very physically debilitated and we wanted to have a baseline pre-surgically -surgi pre 
that established um, their, their their best level of function once nutrition, bed sores, and mobilization had been managed. Uh, they then underwent surgery and had a 60-day off period. So the electrodes went into the central thalamus, but then they were not turned on for two months. And that was to avoid any confounds of initiation of gene expression just based on the placement of the electrodes and any other known mechanisms, most of which were um, not, you know, not, not expected to, to persist after 14 days or 30 days, but we added a factor of two with 60 days to make sure that the baseline that was established before deep brain stimulation was turned on in this titration period was stable. I'll show you the data, some of the data in a minute. The titration period lasted a bit longer than we anticipated because no one had done this in minimally conscious state. We needed to establish safety and explore the stimulation on parameters. Once we settled on a set of parameters, we thought <clears throat> were the best for stimulation, the patient then went into a blinded 30 day on, 30 day off, six month crossover trial. So this entire, this entire study lasted in this patient about 483 days. Um, these are the data obtained using subscores of the Coma Recovery Scale Revised. There should be a dash R there. Uh, and this is sort of turning these subscores into um, an intuitive understanding. A, a score of two on this oral motor subscore meant that the patient could vocalize but not produce words. And they stated a two pre and post surgery. But after 18 hours of exposure to deep brain stimulation, the patient began to uh, be able to speak words in response to prompts. And they did this reliably, in fact, so reliably that it never changed after uh, this initial period of titration. These are the cumulative hours of exposure to stimulation during this study. The other two measures uh, showed fluctuation. The arousal level measure at its top, which is labeled sustained attention, really means that the patient only fails up to three times to follow a command. If they fail four times, then they drop to a level of two. And this was a level of function that the patient showed pre-surgically. Um, we didn't get a three in the post-surgical period, but the overall distribution statistics were the same. But once stimulation started, uh, arousal level was markedly improved. And finally, uh, most impressive in some ways, was the, object, the uh, motor score. So a motor score of five indicates automatic movement, something like shaking hands, whereas functional object use of six means the patient has to demonstrate how to use a comb, a, a cup, uh, some, 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 some tool, and, and utilize two different tools um, twice during an, a performative exam. And this was something that also emerged for the first time in six years after injury with deep brain stimulation. And then during the titration phase when deep brain stimulation was on and off, fluctuated in uh, its measurement. The patient went after the five month titration into a six month crossover trial where we found very definite evidence of statistical linkage of deep brain stimulation to, to response. Notably, all of the pre-frequencies of maximum score rating uh, on, on this uh, graph reflect a, a zero rating, or in this case for communication, as I mentioned, 30% of the time the patient could look at a yes or no uh, printed card with one eye patch. But when we tested the patient during the titration, uh, during the, the crossover phase, they now spoke or gestured reliably, and, and they had no uh, change on or off stimulation because they had re restored reliable spoken communication or gestural communication. The arousal level uh, score, again, the reason there's a zero here is in the titration post uh, his testing, as I showed you, we didn't get a three. But here we got threes almost all the time, but significantly more of them on. Uh, the motor score was, in fact, capped as well, but we developed a more stringent limb control score, which was DBS on-off modulated. The speaking, the object naming, was unchanged, whether on or off stimulation. but perhaps most significant clinically, oral feeding, deglutation, chewing and swallowing. The patient could eat three meals a day on deep brain stimulation. This reemerged during the titration phase. Up until that point, he was fed through a percutaneous gastrostomy tube. However, once 
the deep brain stimulation was turned off after about a week or two, the patient became unsafe to feed again. So there was a very strong modulation of oral feeding. And collectively, these data really showed us that deep brain stimulation in central thalamus, even in a patient with a post herniation level, severe uh, brain injury, Glasgow coma scale three, remaining in minimally conscious state for six years, could in principle, in proof of principle here, restore spoken communication, executive motor control, and integrative uh, visceral motor functions such as chewing and swallowing. The other, note, other thing we noticed in this trial, and this goes back to the demonstration I showed you with the very short activation with optogenetic stimulation and the carryover effects in the frontal stradal system, was that in addition to having a very strong deep brain stimulation on-off effect, this is now the speaking and the verbalization, what you see is that there's a slight slope of inc linear increase against the zero baseline of no spoken language, which is accounting for the fact that the patient could continue to get oral motor scores of, of three, even off stimulation during the titration phase. And this is interesting because this demonstrates plasticity. This demonstrates a element of what's going on outside of the acute dynamical effects of the stimulation that's underneath the, um, the level of self-firing and has something to do with changes interneuronally that are allowing the system to become more responsive over time. In another patient in this trial who did not show a behavioral effect um, at, that we could measure at the bedside through the coma recovery scale revised, uh, we found that sleep dynamics change. This patient uh, started 20 years after a very severe diffuse axonal injury, um, had a coma recovery scale rating of 10 at baseline. That's about half of what the uh, minimally conscious state patient and the prior uh, data uh, began with. That, that patient began with a, a score of about 19. And in this patient, sleep-wake was disordered at baseline. And at the time, we'd identify what we, at that point, had called a slow-wave-like or mixed state. I will show you in the next slide that really what this reflects is something that was known in the literature. Uh, called alpha delta sleep, but that once deep brain stimulation had been on for two years, we found that stage two and slow wave sleep had reemerged. And by three years, not only had they reemerged, but they had become uh, faster in their spindle frequency in stage two, and delta peak power had increased, and the and the spindle like peak in the slow wave sleep pa patterns had been removed. And we saw the reemergence of REM sleep. Um, and these and the tracing started to look much more like normal sleep. Uh, in addition, the overall architecture of sleep, this is a control uh, hypnogram with uh, sleep wake architecture. The overall con the overall architecture of the sleep wake hypnogram began to normalize, particularly with the um, removal of the alpha delta sleep and the inclusion of a REM sleep cycle. And notably, uh, after about eight years, when the patient's battery life came to an end, um, we had an opportunity to study them for one year off of deep brain stimulation. And during this period of time, what we saw was that this alpha delta sleep, which was seen pre-stimulation and then went away during the period of deep brain stimulation, reemerged. And most, but not all, of the gains in uh, slow wave and stage two sleep had, uh, had slid backwards. We do not have a published study uh, for this yet, but this patient did have a battery replacement and a first study uh, follow-up on him has been um, interrupted because of COVID, unfortunately, but even within a few weeks of deep brain stimulation, again, at a time point out here, uh, we saw normalization of most, most of the features. Uh, that we had seen during the earlier phase. So we it, we did not see, seek an ABAB study, but over time uh, we've ended up with an ABAB demonstration that that the entire sleep wake architecture can be modulated by central thalamic deep brain stimulation. And I forgot to say, and it's very important to understand these uh, data, that deep brain stimulation in all these studies has been turned off at night. So the stimulation is only occurring during the day. So these changes in sleep 
are inducing a large scale plasticity in the sleep architecture as a result of the daytime driving through the central thalamus. Central thalamus is doing its job on its own during the night. So this brings us to my third example. In my third example, this is part of an ongoing clinical trial, which we are nearing completion of, uh, com combining the efforts of Wild Cornell Medicine, Stanford, Harvard, Cleveland Clinic, University of Utah, the NIH, and the Medtronic Corporation, all funded through the US Brain Initiative. And we've initiated a six patient pilot study to look for the optimal uh, population of patients who might respond to central thalamic deep brain stimulation after coma. And the theory is that the impact of central thalamic deep brain stimulation is expected to be maximal where it's exerted across large populations of partially deafferented, underactive, but largely preserved neuronal pools. And where is that sweet spot? Well, we've, we've decided to look at the patients who emerge to the level of a Glasgow outcome scale five or extended uh, five or six or seven level. These are patients who um, are able to recover independence, but not get back to the level of their, their pre-injury baseline. So this study, the Century S study, is, is looking to establish the feasibility of targeting these regions in the central thalamus, activating central thalamic fiber projections to the frontal and straight neuronal populations that I showed you they project to, to establish the safety of doing this in patients who are independent in function in their chronic phase of recovery, but unable to, for example, go back to school and per, or, or perform the jobs that they were performing prior to this, uh, this injury. And um, we, uh, we, we are aiming at six patients. Uh, five patients have been through the study so far. We're working on the six now. Uh, all patients have to have a history of severe traumatic brain injury. Um, it'd be at least two years out. And uh, these are the criteria for the Glasgow Outcome Scale extended score of five to seven. No longer requiring supervision in the home, but not return to unsupervised employment or academic study. Or if they have, it's their unsupervised employment or academic capacity remains reduced compared to their prior level. Um, the first patient in the study we reported in 2019, this is a 40-year-old woman who had had a uh, motor vehicle accident 18 years prior to our enrollment. So again, we're now two decades out again. Uh, the patient was comatose for 14 days. Uh, she recovered to a Glasgow coma outcome scale extended level of five. She was independent. I attempted to go back to work uh, and to go back to uh, educational pursuits, but just was unable to sustain them. Uh, she had bilateral, central lateral, thalamic deep brain stimulation, uh, and she uh, went through our protocol, which involves a three-month open-label treatment phase. The uh, central lateral thalamus and a uh, adjacent fiber bundle, known as the dorsal tegmental tract, was targeted. Uh, for the stimulation. These are, uh, dem these are diffusion tensor images of her um, central lateral thalamus uh, projections in the DTTM into the frontal systems on each side of her brain and uh, representations of the orientation of the deep brain stimulating electrodes within the central thalamus on both sides of the brain. Uh, and this is what we found. In this trial, the um, outcomes, the primary outcome measure was the trails making, tra trail making uh, test B, which is a uh, sort of an omnibus test of uh, cerebral processing speed, working memory, and sustained attention. And our pre selected uh, outcome threshold for a success was a 10% improvement, which would be targeted, say, in a three month post-injury rehab program uh, if it was initiated in the first year. Again, we're beginning 18 years out uh, in this patient. And she had a very delayed trails uh, B time of 153 seconds. There was a post-surgical effect, which washed out at the treatment start. And by treatment end, we found that the patient had a 15% improvement in their trail making B test. The secondary measure, was the uh, traumatic brain injury uh, quality of life assessment fatigue measure, which also showed a 70% uh, a improvement. And, and then we had other uh, measures uh, 
including the River Mead uh, Symptom Index, the PHQ-9, uh, tests of executive attention and um, uh, fun and, and executive function and attentional measures. And all of these, all of these measures showed positive increases. But what this meant to the patient in um, sort of personal terms was it was more impressive in some ways. Uh, this patient took a nap every day from about four or five o'clock to get through their day and really couldn't go out and do stuff at night. That was their baseline. Beginning deep brain stimulation, this 70% improvement in the fatigue scale correlated with stopping napping. The patient stopped napping and has never napped since and has gone on to basically uh, having much more extended uh, day as a result of being more alert. The uh, trail making B test, it's not you know, immediate to translate these things into everyday um, activities, but one of the every, everyday activities that the patient was unable to enjoy for 18 years was reading. And during the trial, as stimulation continued, the patient reacquired the ability to read and enjoy reading and retain information. And they would come to the uh, visits at Stanford and talk to our um, postdoc, who's now a young faculty member there, and tell them about the bestsellers on the New York Times bestsellers list they were reading, some of which the postdoc had, had herself read, and discuss the plot lines and the characters. And this was a major change. Other, other interesting changes occurred that uh, were not part of the captured uh, performative measures that we, 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 we prospectively organized. One of the more interesting ones was that the patient noticed within the first day of stimulation that for the first time in 18 years that they could open their toes on the left foot. This, this led to a regaining of balance. And uh, by the end of the trial, the patient walked into uh, the testing in high heels for the first time, and at that point, maybe 19 or 20 years. So um, these are the kinds of things that we've seen uh, so far. And I think collectively what I've shown you in this short period of time is just that on the one hand, careful controlled studies are key because you need to study this phenomena very uh, precisely to see if there are causal effects linked to DBS. But um, across the range from minimally conscious state to go see five, seven, we have proof of concept evidence that uh, deep brain stimulation shows promise to restore function and imp improvement in quality of life for patients. And um, this is you know, linked not only to stimulation, but also the latent capacity for neuronal networks to undergo plasticity that can be measured and seen in pretty dramatic ways. So I think that um, the point of the talk today was to bring these data out because they're all published in some form. The later trial will be published once it's all completed. And, um, and they, they frame a lot of other studies and a lot of other observations with uh, spontaneous recovery in time or induced by pharmacologic therapies that should encourage us to try to work with patients across their life cycle. Um, the Century S study, as I mentioned, is the collaboration across several universities. Myself, Jamie Henderson, who's a neurosurgeon at Stanford, Joe Giacino at Harvard, who's our neuropsychologist, Andre Machado, who's a neurosurgeon at Cleveland, and Chris Butson at the University of Utah, are our principal investigators. My laboratory at, um, in New York, several of the people contributed to the slides I showed you, and several of the funding uh, organizations that have supported us over the years are noted on this slide. And again, I thank you for your time uh, and interest in uh, this talk today. Okay, 